Good morning, and welcome to the first session of our Lunch and Learn webinar series for 2022. My name is Judy Cohen, and I serve as the current president of the International Dyslexia Association Florida branch. On behalf of our entire board, I would like to welcome you to this webinar, and thank you for taking time from your Saturday to join us. A few reminders. As you know, our vision is that all students in Florida will receive structured literacy instruction provided by effective teachers who understand the science of reading. Uh, also, please know that all our recordings and many wonderful resources from previous sessions are available on our website, which is fl.dyslexiaita.org. Before we get started, a few housekeeping notes. Everyone is muted, but feel free to use the Q&A or chat tools throughout the session. There will be a Q&A after the presentation, and um, Tatiana has agreed to answer some questions during the session. And um, you know, with this, we will try to answer all your questions as much as possible. Regarding certificates of attendance, um, teachers may earn ESC credits toward their 20-hour ESC recertification requirement and earn in-service points toward the required 40 points needed for the recertification requirement for House Bill 769, 7069. Participants need to check with their individual county's CEU ESC coordinator to determine if this CEU would be accepted. In order to obtain a certificate of attendance for each webinar, you must attend the webinar in its entirety and the webinar must be attended live. Attendance and time spent in the session is recorded electronically during the live session. Those who attend the session in its entirety will receive a certificate of attendance approximately one to two weeks following the webinar. So to today's session, how language affects reading, what parents and professionals need to know. And our presenter is Ms. Tatiana Elisef. Tatiana is a bilingual speech and language pathologist who specializes in working with at-risk children who present with complex language and literacy needs. She has been published in a variety of professional journals, as well as presented for numerous national and international medical, academic, and nonprofit organizations, as well as speech language hearing associations. She is a clinical instructor at the RWJ Medical School Department of Psychiatry, a clinical supervisor at Rutgers Day School, and a co-founder of the CEU Smart Hub a professional development organization that offers online high caliber evidence-based conferences and continuing education trainings for speech language pathologists and related professional professionals. It is my pleasure to welcome Tatiana Elisef. Judith, thank you so much for this wonderful introduction. And I'm like, honestly, so thrilled to be here. I'm watching the chat blow up and I see people from Bulgaria, people from Australia. God bless you, it is 3 a.m. there. And people from Canada. So it's such an exciting international event. And I'm absolutely thrilled to be here. And I'm absolutely thrilled to be talking about my favorite subject. Oh my God, Abu Dhabi, India. Whoa, this is exciting. So you know what? We have quite a bit to go through. So without further ado, why don't I share my slide and we're just gonna go ahead and get started. All right, as I mentioned before, I am absolutely happy to answer all questions. So um, very, very happy to do so. Let's make sure everybody sees my slides. How about instead of everybody just go ahead and rush and say yes, why don't you tell me no if a problem occurs? So otherwise, I'm assuming that everybody can see me really well and hear me very well. These slides are available as handouts. I am placing the link into chat right now. You do not need any passwords to access them. This is a direct link. Just hit the link, go ahead and download them from there. And it is from my new website, which most of you haven't seen yet, tatianalsf.com slash florida dash ida. That's it. And you can just go ahead and um, look for those there. If some people are joining a little bit later, feel free to reshare that link so everyone has access to the handouts. Truly an international crowd, incredibly exciting to see you all. Really great. 
the recording, I believe, will be posted for participants and everyone who has registered for this presentation, to my understanding, will receive a link of a recording, but it will also be available on the Florida IDA uh, YouTube channel as well. All right. I want to go ahead and get started. So we're going to talk about the role of language in acquisition of reading, and we're going to talk about why children with reading difficulties have to be assessed for language deficits. We want to talk about how undetected language deficits can seriously hamper reading interventions to the point where students are not making progress and plateauing. And also, I want to offer suggestions regarding some more psychometrically sound assessments of language only, because this presentation is restricted to language for this particular purpose. So the participants have a good knowledge, including professionals and parents, which assessments of language have good quality, which assessments are psychometrically sound, which assessments are appropriate, and which assessments should be avoided for particular reasons. These are our learning objectives, the role of language and acquisition of literacy, explanations why these kids need to be assessed for language, recognizing how undetected language deficits can impact reading. Then we're going to talk about formal assessment instruments, and we will talk about several clinical assessment tasks, which are absolutely mandatory for supplementation when it comes to um, reading uh, difficulty identification. All right. So everything begins with language. When somebody is having difficulty, it's very important to identify those language difficulties right away. So oral language serves as a foundational framework for reading, spelling, and writing. So when you will see kids display language difficulties in early childhood, that should be a significant amount of warning to let you know later on, unless those difficulties are ameliorated, there is going to be some literacy trouble, which will manifest itself in a variety of ways. And that's very important to understand. We're really working here on identification as a preventative model. We want to prevent reading failure as, you know, before it even starts. We want to be able to recognize reading difficulties before they start. And that's going to happen with recognizing the language limitations of these kids. Preventative measures work far better than uh, actual intervention measures. Because when you really think about it, what is easier to prevent something, a disease like diabetes or to treat something like that? And the answer is if it is prevented, it saves the person so much trouble. Similar to medicine, um, literacy intervention should be taken just as seriously because it essentially expands all the horizons for the kids in question and defines what they're going to be doing for their livelihood, defines their success in life and so on and so forth. So that's why it's so important to treat difficulties in oral language very seriously because oral language is, a strong oral language is a foundation for um, these literacy abilities which children develop um, in life um, later on when they enter school. All right, so let's see. Now, to move on, let's talk a tiny bit about the role of statistical learning plays in language acquisition. And that's very, very important to understand. Statistical learning is essentially an unconscious process of learning the patterns in one's environment learning the probabilities that if certain events will occur or occur together in, in specific sequences. So language itself and language learning itself has numerous statistical properties. So for example, for this particular presentation, let's focus on the role of vocabulary. Vocabulary learning is very much statistical. Children with smaller vocabularies, they don't simply know fewer words. It's not as simple as that. They also know about less about language, they know less about the world, and they know and they have less background knowledge. And as we all know, background knowledge plays one of the important roles in the development of reading comprehension. So because of that, 
it's very important to understand the way language is acquired is very much through statistical links. Words are statistically linked to other words, and they're linked to levels of linguistic representation. Words carry information about sentences and how it can occur. So when we talk about statistics, when we talk about learning in general, learning language can be learned through two different specific ways. Language learning can be implicit as well as explicit. So implicit learning is basically the ability to learn language almost like automatically, subconsciously, without paying explicit attention. It what typically happens with typically, typically developing infants and toddlers as they grow. They're picking up on these statistical patterns. They're learning complex and subtle regularities that underlie a language, but they're learning it even without realizing it. So it's a very subconscious process. That's not how language impaired kids can learn language. They're going to have significant difficulty with learning language implicitly. They will need tremendous, tremendous, tremendous amount of explicit language instruction. And this is a language instruction which is medi mediated by teachers, it's mediated by parents, it is mediated by speech pathologists, it is mediated by learning specialists, by tutors, whoever you name it. So students with language and learning needs will need explicit teaching opportunities and in order to get the necessary language abilities. That is very, very, very important. They need the teaching of concepts their peers will require automatically without active thinking. They will require more effort. It will be more effort on their part to learn. It will also require more effort on our part to teach. It's a reciprocal relationship which requires a tremendous amount of effort. Now, So what happens when language learning is impaired? Well, in the words of Pukins by Helen Lester, Lots. There's going to be notable differences in how the child is communicating, expressing himself, themselves, reading, writing as compared to other kids. Their deficits may be quite obvious, which are of course much easier to catch, or they may be quite hidden and covert. So for example, when the deficits are obvious and somebody has very short sentence length, when somebody has difficulty formulating sentences or understanding and using um, language, it's a lot more obvious than when somebody seems to have a very robust lexicon, but they're having difficulties understanding ambiguous language. They're having difficulty defining uh, figurative language. They're having difficulties with metalinguistic and metacognitive aspects of language. So some kids with hidden difficulties may have really high IQ and incredibly high verbally, but they may have significant difficulty in uh, using that lexicon for oral narratives, for reading comprehension purposes, and for written expression purposes. Because essentially, what we need these things for is to express higher forms of language. We don't need to know vocabulary words for labeling or pointing. We need our vocabulary to tell stories, recount events, comprehend complex text, and write complex essays. This is what determines our academic success in school, college, as well as life. So this brings me to the idea that the kids who are having difficulty learning language from childhood will be diagnosed with something called developmental language disorder. I use the label developmental language disorder to refer to kids who have been having difficulty acquiring language from an early age. Now, they have difficulties comprehending and expressing themselves. Those difficulties are absolutely not related to other conditions such as genetic syndromes or autism spectrum disorder or some form of intellectual disability or structural and functional abnormalities such as hearing impairment. They tend to have normal development in all areas with the exception of language. The old label for this used to be SLI and the new label is DLD. 
So this recent name change, which occurred in approximately, it started in being in talks in 2016, but by 2017, it was actualized. This is, it better reflects the difficulties these kids are having. And um, there's a couple of important points to know. These difficulties start early, but they persist into adulthood. They significantly impact functioning. These kids will require additional assistance. This, uh, the speech pathologist will do assessment and treatment. Other professionals may also contribute to assessment and treatment. And there will be special education placements if these difficulties persist into school age. So. Here is something developed by the Royal College of Speech Language Therapists. It's a neat little infographic, which essentially sums up what I mentioned before. These language difficulties provide a barrier to communication and learning every day. The child's language problems will continue past the age of five. The problems will not be, are not associated with known biomedical conditions such as brain injuries, chromosome disorders, or neurodegenerative conditions. That's where it's at. Okay. There are certain risk factors which are known to researchers, which sort of foreshadow the fact that somebody will have a language and literacy disorder. So I quickly wanted to mention these because it is important to know that when we're, we're working with kids diagnosed with these conditions, hugely important to understand language may be impacted, literacy may be impacted, please have high awareness. Kids with genetic syndromes, kids with intellectual disability, there is a huge genetic component to all language and literacy impairments. There is a very strong component to all psychiatric impairments. Be, so somebody needs to be aware of that, that kids who do have a family history of that will present with those type of difficulties. Somebody asked a question, can a child with a hearing impairment have a diagnosis of DLD or would it be considered a biomedical issue? For the purposes of how the Catalyze Project defined DLD, it, was, it would be considered to be DLD associated with a hearing impairment, where the hearing impairment would be the primary diagnosis, so it would be biomedical issue. So it would be a biomedical issue which accompanies DLT. Make sense? And that's exactly how the Catalyze Project defined that DLT for those type of purposes. Similarly, if somebody has a diagnosis of ASD or autism spectrum disorder and they're having language deficits, autism will be the primary and language deficits accompanying autism would be secondary. It wouldn't be considered pure DLT, all right? Very important to understand, kids from, with certain developmental histories are very predisposed to language and literacy deficits. Kids particularly are coming from households with abuse and neglect, kids who spend time in the care system, whether it's domestically adopted kids or internationally adopted kids, they are also predisposed to that. Kids with early history of trouble, early intervention services, kids who were classified as preschool dis uh, disabled before declassification are definitely somebody you should be in a close uh, watch for. Kids with social communication, pragmatic, psychiatric, and behavioral deficits, huge, huge correlation with language and literacy disorders. How do I know? Because I spent the last 14 years working for a psychiatric hospital where I work with an out of in and out of different school with kids with very complex psychiatric conditions and accompanying complex language and literacy deficits. So there is a very, very long history of that and they really need to be mindful for. Another example of kids who will be at risk for literacy deficits are those kids who supposedly acquiring the language in a seemingly appropriate fashion, but they have tremendous trouble as little four and five year olds doing rhymes, reciting poems, learning the alphabet. They have really tremendous amount of difficulty for um, basic concepts, for colors, learning new names and learning new words. 
definitely something to be on the lookout for. Very numerous kit, numerous numerous kits assessed, which who I assessed for that, who displayed that pattern of and then displayed future literacy needs. Sometimes the causation is idiopathic. There will be some kids with no recognizable family history that we know of. Supposedly, super history is very clear for learning disabilities, but they could be at risk for literacy deficits if uh, they display a certain pattern of linguistic difficulties, and that's during their early development. So the issues are, if a child experiences deficits in foundational language, there will most certainly show difficulties in far more complex areas of language, such as reading, spelling, and writing. So that is something we need to be mindful of. So the warning side of literacy deficits in young kids will start being manifested in a number of completely different ways. Number one, you can read somebody's family history and see a documented history of language impairment, and you're going to yourself, okay, I have to be mindful. This may turn into something bigger. They received services at an early age, and then again, they may have trouble recognizing certain or meeting certain early literacy markers. So when that happens, even if their family history appears to be free and clear, but if you're displaying certain difficulties, such as learning numbers and letters and recognizing rhymes, and they're having difficulty with novel names, even in the absence of that family history, it may be important for them to undergo assessment in order to get some inkling for us, whether intervention is warranted. Okay, let's look a tiny bit about the hierarchy of oral language development. And it's important uh, for understanding of what's happening when it comes to language. We learn to listen before we learn to speak. We start comprehending a lot earlier than we start expressing ourselves. Comprehension can start as early as you know, four months in a meaningful way. Expression uh, primarily can happen around 11 months of age, 12 months of age. You know, you go from discrete units into the big, um, you know, totality. You start, you speak in single words before you do conversations. You start reading single words before you go to chapter books or technical manuals. Um, you start spelling CDC words before you start spelling uh, multisyllabic words of complex consonantal patterns. So oral language develops along a continuum. Listening comprehension and verbal expression are the foundational framework for development of writing, reading, spelling, and so on and so forth. So effective assessment for learners who struggle in the areas of literacy will involve assessing not just their literacy abilities, but also their oral language competency. And that's very, very important. Okay. All right. So let's talk about oral language competence. Oh, Aleta asked, can you give an example of a real life example in language learning of statistical learning? Okay, so for example, let's talk about vocabulary words and typically developing kids. So when somebody is typically developing and let's see, we want them to learn the word. Let's pick something. I was gonna say, let's pick something easy, but then my word was gonna be despondent. Um, so, but let's pick the word despondent. But technically speaking, despondent will be easy to a four-year-old. So you're basically trying to read a little story or watch a little, um, you know, watch a little animated film of a child. So for example, um, you know, I have a little four-year-old niece with whom I was watching an uh, animated movie, Wind Up. It, uh, it won a tremendous amount of awards, you know, really lovely movie, fantastic for using with clients and, uh, you know, typically developing kids a lot. So when they were discussing the movie, I used, you know, the... I, several times I used the words dejected and despondent, you know, interchangeably when I was referring to the mood of a father whose little girl is in a coma due to head trauma. 
So, you know, I know, heavy topic for a four-year-old, but still though, she really wanted to watch that movie. So, and her parents, um, you know, are super woke. So we're, we're all good to go. Um, so essentially speaking, after we discussed that video, um, you know, as we were going through it, she, I literally heard her use the word despondent in an unrelated way in the conversation with her parents in a completely, you know, appropriate manner. Of course, she was despondent because she wasn't getting ice cream after dinner. But still, though, she was absolutely appropriate because she made a sad face when she was doing that. But and this would be an example of statistical learning. This child heard me use that word a number of times. She picked up on the conversation how that word was used. She figured out it needs to be used in specific context. I must have used that word maybe four or five times. Done deal. She picked up on a pattern of that vocabulary word learning. And this would be an example of statistical learning, um, you know, through vocabulary. Of course, it gets a little bit, uh, it's, this is a little bit of a simplistic explanation in a sense. If you read Mark Seidenberg's article from 2018, we do give examples of a lot more types of patterns of statistical learning, including for phonemic awareness, including for phonics, including for or um, other words and patterns, but this would be something very kind of like basic and simplistic to explain. Thank you. Uh, I'm just going to put the movie for everybody. The movie is called Wind Up by Unity. Really lovely movie. If you're not crying, you're a monster. <laughs> but it's a beautiful movie. It's basically about um, a dad who is persevering through the fact that his little girl is in a coma due to head trauma and he keeps playing a particular music box to the little girl in order for her to wake up. Beautiful stuff. I use animated films you know, with uh, typically developing kids as well as with um, language impaired clients alike. In fact, on uh, February 25th, during the Power Up Conference and Intervention, I will be doing a presentation on the evidence-based use of animated films to target language goals. And if anybody is interested in that, I'm happy to provide more information in a link to that of how I use animated films and movies, because I also make a lot of recommendations for a ton of very useful animated films. But didn't think I was going to mention animated films for this particular purpose, but somehow it worked out. All right. Oral language competence. So it strongly predicts reading comprehension and written composition outcomes. It is very strongly related. It is absolutely strongly related to narrative production. When you have poor discourse and narrative abilities, that places kids automatically for at risk for learning and literacy related difficulties. And that includes, of course, reading problems. Language produced during story retelling is also very positively related to bilingual reading intervention. I specialize in bilingualism. I do a lot of work in bilingualism, so I had to put that in there. Couldn't resist doing that, even though this presentation is not on bilingualism. Narrative analysis really helps us very clearly and immediately distinguish kids with developmental language disorder from their typically developing peers. Narrative weaknesses are very, 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 cannot overemphasize that part, strongly connect connected to pragmatic deficits. Students who have decreased narrative abilities will show a lot of social problems. They have decreased gestalt processing. Gestalt processing refers to the idea of seeing the big picture of messages, of stories, of movies versus focusing on unrelated parts. They have very significantly decreased organization and coherence of verbal output, a lot of word finding difficulties. So for example, if somebody has decreased organization and coherence, instead of smoothly speaking like I am now connecting concepts together, they would be essentially doing a lot of stumbling and fumbling and bumbling when it comes to organizing their thoughts for meaningful outcome purposes. They use fewer perspective-taking terms, which denote mental states. Uh, they, use, they may use some irrelevant, inappropriate, or even bizarre utterances when they are speaking. And we'll talk a little bit more about assessment of narratives in ensuing slides. All right. 
let's move on. And again, if anybody has any questions or wants to follow up on anything I'm saying, I'm just put it in chat, put it in Q&A, and I'm absolutely happy to do so. So let's talk about explicitly how narrative abilities are related to reading development, because the entire point here is for us to explain how those two are connected and why oral language is so important. Well, we have a lot of research which shows kids with reading difficulties show difficulties in production and comprehension of oral narratives. We have findings from pretty large scale studies, which basically show a lot of consistent and you know, moderate correlation between oral language and reading. We have studies which show that kids' performance in the story retelling task is a better predictor of later reading achievement than other aspects of oral language, such as vocabulary and syntax. Kids' oral narrative skills are correlated with reading skills at older ages. So basically, after two to three years, you check their reading instruction and you see that those kids who did really well in the area of narratives are actually stronger readers. Kids with poor oral language competence display poor reading comprehension and written composition abilities. They do so even in the presence of fairly intact non-word reading and fairly intact reading fluency skills. And that's very important to understand because we have a subset of children who are good decoders, they're very solid, they do read quite smoothly and fluently, and uh, their accuracy is really quite acceptable, and it's acceptable even as per um, requirements outlined by Jan Hasbrook when she talks about fluent and smooth reading, which she basically says you really need to be 95% accurate in order to understand text. That's a lot. That's a pretty high accuracy, but their reading comprehension abilities are completely impaired as when compared to their non-word reading or real word reading and their reading fluency. And why is that? Very simple, poor oral language competence, poor narrative abilities. All of those things are strongly affecting their reading comprehension. So, so, um, somebody says, you mentioned gestalt processing. Will you please address gestalt language processes as related to scripting? For this particular purpose, it would be unrelated to the purpose of this presentation. So I think it may be taking away the time from the focus of how it's related to reading comprehension and written expression, but I'm happy for you to, you know, email me privately and I would be happy to talk more about that. I just don't want to take the time away from the purpose of our presentation here. All right. Well, let's talk a little bit about reading comprehension. There are a few things which are very, very important to understand. Reading comprehension is not a unitary skill. Please never assume that reading comprehension is one skill. Reading comprehension is approximately 17 skills interwoven together. It is a collection of skills. Solid language abilities will very strongly correlate with reading comprehension outcomes. Uh, reading comprehension also depends on oral vocabulary knowledge. Strong discourse and narrative abilities will significantly positively correlate with reading comprehension abilities. Knowledge of literate vocabulary words in isolation and in context of read words is very important for the purposes of reading comprehension, but so are aspects such as background knowledge, inference making, grasp of text structures, grasp of literacy, uh, literary devices. Processing and working memory play a huge role in uh, reading comprehension. Pragmatic competence plays a huge role in reading comprehension. Verbal reasoning abilities and inferencing abilities, both at the general level and at the sentence level, play a huge role in reading comprehension. Comprehension of complex syntactic structures plays a huge role in reading comprehension. So that is very, very important to understand. 
Somebody asked me, can you cite the evidence from 95% decoding for reading comprehension purposes? That actually comes from a recent presentation by Jan Hasbro. That one was recorded by Georgia Ida, if I'm not mistaken. If you, um, I believe they post all of their presentations on YouTube, just like Florida Ida does. So if you access that presentation, which absolutely is phenomenal, by the way, I do highly recommend um, viewing it. By the way, uh, this is what Jan, Jan Hasberg says, that 95% decoding is necessary for reading comprehension. But that does not mean that I necessarily um, fully endorse and subscribe that because there is a huge number of caveats for that. So there's going to be some kids who are never going to attain 95% accuracy for reading comprehension purposes, but we can teach them to be pretty solid comprehenders. Tanya asks, what are the 17 factors that impact reading on reading comprehension? This is a part of a different presentation that um, I'm happy to share with you after this, but I just kind of wanted to focus on immediately what we're doing here. So I'm happy to share afterwards if you email me or if you tag me on Facebook, so I'm happy to do that. Okay, now. All right. There you go. So let's talk about type of oral language deficits affecting literacy abilities. So we have phonology, morphology, vocabulary and semantics, syntax, and pragmatics. Just for the fun of it, just for the fun of it, who wants to take a couple of seconds and type up in chat? how each of these affect literacy abilities. Who wants to say phonology affects literacy, blah, 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 blah. Morphology affects literacy in such and such way. I would love it. I know it's a big group and I know that it's kind of like fun, but let's see if I can get a little bit of an audience participation. I love getting audience participation. So I would love it if we could. Okay, somebody keeps asking about the handouts, not a problem. Here is that. I posted the website. Um, phonology affects decoding and encoding of words, beautiful. Um, but pragmatics affects literacy through differences. I'm not entirely certain what that means without further explanations. Morphology affects decoding and comprehension, beautiful. Syntax impacts literacy for being able to identify word reference. Inferences, not differences, sorry. <laughs> okay, no problem. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, you guys. You are all fabulous. Perfect. Phonology will affect somebody's acquisition of phonemic awareness as well as potentially phonics. Morphology will affect how we read and write. For example, let's see somebody's reading about deconstruction after the Civil War. Well, the word deconstruction has multiple prefixes and affixes, but the main uh, base word is struct. So structure, structural, reconstruction, deconstruction, um, and so on and so forth. So when somebody is reading about reconstruction after the Civil War, they may not understand that they can deconstruct the word reconstruction, get to the base word of struct, and every affix which was built up onto struct still refers to essentially the word to build. So for these particular people, uh, so for these particular readers, reconstruction, deconstruction, deconstructing. All of that is going to be completely separate words versus for good solid readers, they will understand that words can be manipulated for morphologically adding prefixes and affixes, but essentially we're still talking about some form of building. Syntax, if, if a reading comprehension passage has complex syntax, it's gonna be very difficult for somebody to um, decode it. It's also going to be rather, um, difficult for somebody to use written compositions with complicated syntax structures. 
pragmatics. If there is ambiguous structures, irony and sarcasm in text. If there is some inferential thinking that needs to be involved, if there is critical thinking that needs to be involved, if there is going to be some twisted meanings and twisted endings, such as if anybody has ever read O. Henry, all of that is going to affect your comprehension and all that is ultimately going to affect your literacy competency. Children with reading difficulties and deficits can have deficits in all of these areas. And research shows us that oral language deficits place kids at a much higher risk for dyslexia. Research also shows that having DLD places kids as a, at a much higher risk for developing reading deficits. Let's quickly look at the chat to see if I haven't, uh, you know, missed anything. Boop, 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 boop. Yep, somebody putting it, talking about pragmatics, how it affects, beautiful. Yep, morphology, beautiful. Somebody made a book recommendation by Dr. Hasbro. That was Judith, syntax helps, beautiful. Thank you so much guys for your participation. Okay, so there's definitely a lot of claims I get from parents once in a while and from teachers as well, which basically tell me, well, their language abilities are just fine. So for example, D oh, so somebody saying what does DLD stand for? DLD stands for developmental language D disorder. So a letter says, I've heard the sentence a million times. His language is fine. I believe it was Ronald Reagan who used this expression. I like it. It's uh, so I'm going to use it. It's not an endorsement of Ronald Reagan and his, you know, politics. But there is a, you know, we have this expression in Russian. We use this expression in Russian all the time. Trust but verify. Okay, I believe you. Your language abilities are fine. That's completely fine. Here's what we're going to do. You have already retained me to do a comprehensive language and literacy assessment of your child. It would behoove me to do my job. If your language abilities are fine, I will systematically rule out the presence of language deficits and their effect on literacy competence. This will allow me to unequivocally make these statements with the support of evidence, and it will allow me to design an appropriate reading intervention plan much better for the child in question. And that's really what I essentially say. But unfortunately, I do not endorse in this blind trust, and I've never had that, and I never will. I need to be able to systematically verify that myself through legitimate testing, if that truly is the case. All right, so what to do next? There's differences in language. We have social language versus academic language. Social language may absolutely be intact, and it oftentimes is. Social language is lovely for everyday conversations, for everyday text messages, for slang, for phrases, for, for basic grammatical conventions. But that's not the academic language needed in school to succeed. That's not the metalinguistic and metacognitive nouns and verbs. That is not the language which is used in great sophistication in textbooks and research papers. That's not the language that is acceptable for written compositions. It's very formal. It is sophisticated. It uses a ton of uh, literate vocabulary words, which is um, a phrase from the work by Dr. Marilyn Nepal. Uh, academic language is far more complex. So the child's social language abilities may be beautifully expressed, but their academic language abilities may be sorely lacking. That's very important to understand. So, lovely. Let's talk about pragmatics. If I had a dollar for every single time I saw people separating pragmatics and excluding it from a category of language, I would actually be a very rich woman. There seems to be some sort of a basic disconnect regarding pragmatics, and I see it absolutely everywhere. I see it in our graduate programs. I train about six or so uh, graduate clinicians per year less clinical fellows because we can only kind of like have one or two per year, but I train about six grad students per year from different colleges. 
And every single time the conversation pops up about pragmatics, I am seeing that the students are simply not taught that pragmatics are a part of language. It's content, form, and use. Pragmatics cannot be disconnected from language. Pragmatics are hugely connected to language. And I've literally done presentations on the role of pragmatics in written comprehension and written composition. Pragmatics is everything. In fact, it's not even good grades which affects your life's competency and vocational success. It's your social communication abilities and your abilities to schmooze. There was a fantastic study by a researcher, not in the field of speech pathology, but I believe it's in this field of special education or vocational education, I don't remember anymore, but the name is Christy Laris, the L-L-E-R-A-S. And she did a lovely study, if anybody needs it, just email me and I'll send you the link. And she did a lovely study following up kids from high school to post vocational outcomes. And she found something truly fascinating. The kids who did the best are the ones who were the most social in high school. They were the kids who made more money, earned more promotions, and generally doing better, despite the fact that their grades were not necessarily stellar. We have numerous, numerous studies which show that reading deficits is, are associated with depression, anxiety, attention, and behavioral problems. There is a lot of correlation between psychiatric impairment and poor pragmatic functioning. We have studies which show that these kids are kids with language difficulties and pragmatic deficits are having language deficits. Uh, we're showing that these kids are having a lot of trouble in the area of emotion regulation, and they have a lot of difficulties understanding somebody's affective state. Their pragmatics are just fine is another looted statement signifying nothing. Children with language deficits are impaired in multiple areas of language. Researchers found that kids with language deficits do show numerous pragmatic deficits in the areas of conversations, they can't adjust to the needs of others and social interactions, they're less accepted by peers, they have poorer friendships, they're perceived by teachers are being more withdrawn, they have poor emotional competence and emotional intelligence, um, and we know that kids with DLD, developmental language disorder, present with concomitant pragmatic deficits or difficulties. If they're left untreated, it will absolutely impact their academic outcomes. The deficits may be of internalizing nature, that's when you're more withdrawn, you don't talk as much, but may have a lot of depression and anxiety, or externalizing nature, where you're very behavioral, you're like throwing chairs, rather it's you settle arguments verbally. And that's what's important to understand, that these deficits may manifest in a variety of ways, and they're not always as apparent. So we also know that high quality pragmatic assessments are not routinely administered in school settings or they may be administered, but they're of poor quality. And we're definitely going to talk about the quality of these assessments. So very important. We need to have psychometrically sound assessments of pragmatic abilities, and they should be a required component of all language and literacy evaluations. Okay. Um, I'll let it this question that you asked about so much shame associated with not being to read and how to determine primacy of emotional psychological issues is best is not the best um way to spend my time so i think this is something we could discuss you know um at a later time because it kind of like it doesn't exactly cover the topic of this presentation and i really would like to stick to the point of this uh presentation so, and uh, things like that. Okay. All right. So these are academic language areas which are strongly associated with literacy. So as we mentioned before, having literate vocabulary knowledge is very strongly associated with literacy. Having really good semantic awareness or having semantic processes associated with word reading skills, namely kids read words better when they know their meanings. Morphological awareness, we mentioned that before, it plays a critical role in supporting higher level text processing. It, it is partly mediated by vocabulary knowledge. It becomes an increasingly important predictor of reading comprehension between six and 11 years of age. It makes a unique contribution to reading comprehension ability. 
beyond oral vocabulary and word reading skills. This next slide is not necessarily part of this presentation, but I really, really wanted to throw it in there to explain something very, very um, specific. These are the skills involved in reading fluence. Uh, these are the skills involved in skilled reading. There's tremendous amount of them, and there is a lot of them. So one of the reasons why language competence is so important, and one of the reasons why limited assessments are not successful is because look at how much is involved in skilled reading. Skilled reading is a hugely complicated process. Language competence is involved in every single one of these skills. Absolutely every single one, including, of course, orthographic ma mapping of abilities, since we're trying to produce the sounds of letters, which are the sides, the uh, parts of language. So when we're looking here, language competence, even though it doesn't appear to be, is absolutely embedded in every single one of these skills. Please keep that in mind because without solid language competence, this cannot be attained. You do have access to that, to this um, slide in the handouts. And I deliberately, because uh, some of these things are very small, I deliberately left the handouts as a one slide per page. So it's very clear for everybody so you can access them. Don't forget to click on the highlighted links. They will usually take you to free articles and free resources that you can access on your own. This is a lovely uh, link to a lovely article called the End of Reading Words Wars, and which was written a couple of years ago uh, by Russell and Nation. It's a really it's a you know dense article about forty eight pages or so. Really, really lovely. Uh, talks about this absolutely explicitly. Oh, somebody asked me, with respect to rapid naming, how do you address working memory skills that will affect skilled reading? Excellent question. Very, very quickly, because this is taking away from, um, this is not directly related to language. You will do this by a variety of tasks. You cannot address run directly. You will be doing a lot of phonics activities. You will be working on developing re reading automaticity and reading repetition. You will be working on aspects of decoding and fluency. And what you go what's going to happen is that you will improve uh, rapid automatized naming through those means. Rapid automatized naming can only be done and performed through uh, meaningful functional activities related to language, related to reading. There is no other way to improve rapid automatized naming, and I actually have proof of that because I literally have kids who I've assessed who did incredibly low on RAN-RAS measures, and then after receiving meaningful instruction for about a period of one year, they went from the first percentile to 40 third percentile in RANRAS. Did we work on RANRAS? Absolutely not. We worked on orthographic mapping. We worked on phonemic awareness. We worked on uh, decoding, and that's exactly how they improved. Okay. Okay. Is there a book list anywhere of different ages, grades to build academic vocabulary for those who are not in typical academic settings? Uh, I haven't found a good one, but in the words of Judy Montgomery, you can't really go wrong with, you know, selecting vocabulary words. I think there's ways of building vocabulary. There's definitely specific means of doing so. And I think that um, I do certainly have certain type of text recommendations that I use. By the way, you can always go to my blog. It's listed in the handouts, www.smartspeechtherapy.com. And you can look for some of the past articles that I did in my blog regarding how to implement certain things in therapy with respect to academic vocabulary teaching. And you will actually find lots of resources there. Uh, if you remind me at the end when I'm doing Q&A, I can actually shoot a couple of links your way and help you how to find it easier. But I wanted to get through that presentation. Um, and um, I wanted to go through this presentation first because I'm, I had about 
30 more slides left and approximately uh, 25 minutes to do so. But I just wanted to make sure that you guys get access to this information because I really felt like it was very relevant for you guys to have, even though it seems to be quite, you know, excessive. So, all right. Is it language disorder or learning disability? Well, language disorders do turn into re, uh, learning disabilities. So that's what's really important to understand. If somebody is having difficulties in the foundational areas of language, such as listening and speaking, they'll definitely be having the same issues in much more complex areas of language, such as reading and writing. So many kids with language disorders are later classified with learning disability because their later learning difficulties took on the form of problems acquiring higher levels of spoken language comprehension and expression. These kids may go through a process called as illusory recovery. And it's basically a time period where supposedly all their problems are fixed. But in reality, they're just simply going through a spurt of language growth, coupled with the fact that the academic demands are not terribly significant. So what's going to happen when those academic demands get significant? They're going to present with problems in the area of literacy. And that's exactly when they start getting uh, qualified for special education placements and so on and so forth. So it's very important to understand two sides of the same coin, language disorders morph into learning disabilities. What is SLP's role in literacy? Provided you are trained, that is a caveat. Um, SLPs wear many, many hats. Provided you are highly qualified, competent, and trained, this is what you can do as endorsed by ASHA. But please note, training is a huge part of it. I am not endorsing for SLPs without training to start doing modified barium swallows or doing fees. And I'm not uh, endorsing anything that would put somebody's you know, life in jeopardy otherwise. So I'm not endorsing for anyone who doesn't have literacy abilities all of a sudden to start you know, intervening in literacy. But with appropriate training, the, all of these things are absolutely acceptable by ASHA and are highly endorsed. So... We can, enter, we can get ourselves directly involved in reading, spelling, and writing. We can specialize in both assessment and treatment. We can directly address phonology by working on phonemic awareness abilities, by phonemic blending and manipulation, which are prerequisite abilities needed to read. Click on the highlighted link and you'll see that particular study, which is really quite good. We have specialized knowledge in morphology, Provided we're trained enough, we can assess and treat morphological abilities. We play integral role in assessing and treating reading comprehension deficits. We can treat spelling deficits in school-age children. In fact, a number of high-profile SLPs, such as Dr. Ken Appel, Julie Masterson, Julie Walter, John Rossowitz, they made their entire careers in specializing in working in spelling. We all, speech pathologists also play an integral role in assessing and treating writing deficits in school-aged children. Again, doctors Gary Troyer and Anthony Katsaftis, as well as uh, doctors Nic uh, Nicola Nelson, just to name a few, are just a few examples of researchers who spend quite a bit of their career focused on writing. Now, let's talk about implications for assessment. Because many kids, with language and literacy deficits may not show academic or language-related learning difficulties until academic demands become higher and increase. We really need to assess all of their abilities appropriately, and we really need to look at their abilities and assess both language and literacy skills in order to provide functional assessments and later functional interventions. So, Let's talk about some assessment tasks and what they measure. These tasks are, I know we have a huge international crowd today. These assessment tasks may be quite relevant to them. Some of you guys are not mandated to use standardized assessments. You can design your own or find your own. I actually, on my website, if anybody reminds me, literally the last blog I wrote was free literacy assessment materials for speech language pathologists. You can go there and download all the free information and have access to free tests and procedures and tasks. And it's literally the last um, entry on my blog 
and www.smartspeechtherapy.com. Again, it's listed in the handouts as well. So following, direct, following directions correlate with working memory functioning. They actually are super important and sensitive to reading deficits. Grammatical structure deficits, very strongly associated with language impairment. Vocabulary breadth, depth, quality, and manipulation tasks, hugely related to not vocabulary labeling, but the ability to manipulate vocabulary during narratives, um, hugely related to language deficits. Kids with DLD have really fragile knowledge, not just the core meaning of individual words, but they make, make very, very poor connections between words. Narrative deficits place kids at risk for reading deficits. We talked about that. We talked about that they're significantly correlated with social communication deficits. Sentence recall and non-word repetition tasks are very sensitive to language and literacy deficits. And sentence recall has been recognized for ages and ages and ages as an indicator in a lot of problems. SLI, DLD, dyslexia, uh, reading comprehension deficits, you name it. Non-word repetition is commensurate with spoken and written language deficits and reflects, reflects deficits in both phonology and verbal short-term memory. RAN-RAS, very consistent predictor of reading fluency in all orthographies. You have poor RAN-RAS abilities, and that means you're going to have reading difficulties and they're strongly associated particularly with reading fluency. Phonemic awareness and alphabetic knowledge are, of course, really important for reading. Non-word reading tasks are very sensitive to phonologically based reading deficits, while non-word spelling tasks are more sensitive to determination of spelling difficulties because they allow you to accept alternative plausible spelling patterns instead of real-world spelling assessments, which allow only one correct spelling. However, for real world purposes, you want to do both. It's not an either or situation. You want to look at their non word uh, spelling abilities first, and then you want to see what they're doing poorly with real world spellings because you want to cross compare on where the deficit's coming from. Spelling deficits are not just restricted to phonological awareness. They could be of morphological nature, of orthographic nature, of semantic nature. So because of that, you want to do a cross-comparison analysis. Are vocabulary tests useful for school-age children? Or are single vocabulary tests useful for school-age children? And the answer is no, they're really not. One word vocabulary tests are very often used for supplementation, but they bring absolutely nothing to the table, with the exception of overinflating scores. They're not representative of any form of linguistic competence. They overinflate testing scores, and kids with even superior single word vocabularies could really do incredibly poorly during narrative tasks and very poorly during reading and writing tasks. As such, I never recommend single word vocabulary tests for kids who are speaking because we can assess different abilities that way. Very briefly, educational assessments were never created to determine a disorder. They were developed to rank kids within the range of a general population. Educational assessments do not have reference standard, they don't have criteria and validity, they don't mention sensitivity and specificity and their technical manuals. We don't know their discriminant accuracy, we don't know if they can be used to identify a disorder. Students can do incredibly well on those tests and be incredibly impaired. I talk about that in my presentation, a measurement on psychometric properties of popular reading tests. It is mentioned in, at the end of this presentation as well. Certain things I'm mentioning in this presentation which do bear relevance on this presentation, you can find links in the handouts at the end of the presentation. Okay. So sensitivity and specificity. Sensitivity and specificity are very important for purposes of determining if assessment is a good assessment. 
So sensitivity accurately identifies students who truly have a language and reading disorder as having that disorder. Specificity makes sure you don't accidentally label typically developing kids as being disordered. They determine the test degree of discriminant accuracy or the ability to distinguish the presence of a disorder. Sensitivity and specificity are based on the 1994 criteria established by Vance and Plant. 90% is good discriminant accuracy, 80 to 89% is fair, and below 80%, misidentifications occur at an unacceptably high rate, and they can lead to serious consequences. There's only one problem. Sensitivity and specificity can still be manipulated. So it's very important to also gain the information on the test reference standard. The reference standard is a group to which test participants are compared to determine the child's true diagnostic status. It is considered to be the gold standard of whether or not the child truly has a language disorder. Reference standards are only valid when they reflect the entire sample of possible test takers. That's not often the case. So then you're going to have a condition called spectrum bias, which is going to occur when the reference standard is not well developed. One test which is being accused of spectrum bias and having a poor uh, reference standard is actually the self 5 The leaders project had reviewed this a number of years ago, and they determined that even though the sensitivity and specificity for certain standard deviations of the self 5 appears to be adequate, the reference standard that was used was absolutely unacceptable because it was a very, very small number of kids and their conditions and disorders were not truly known. So that's an example of a test which has a poor reference standard and doesn't really have such solid psychometric properties. Um, one of the reasons why we never want to include the kids with disabilities in the normative sample is because we don't want to normalize a disorder. So we, there is no reason to contaminate the sample because essentially, if you're going to lower the standard deviation to such a significant degree, you will not be able to distinguish between uh, kids who are typically developing and kids who are disordered. So what during the test development stage that can be done, you can certainly have certain items, and this is, goes back to the assessment tasks and what they measure that I've spoken about on previous slides, that you can have those items and uh, determine which typically de developing students pass and which impaired kids fail, and you do so for diagnostic accuracy purposes. Disordered students should not be included in standardization norms because it's going to lower the mean, increase standard deviation, and shift the cut scores. And that's going to result in a less likely identification of impaired students. It's going to normalize the disorder. So you're going to see such significant overlap between disordered and typical kids that it's going to be so great, you won't be able to reliably identify those with an impairment. Okay. Let me quickly look at a few things. All right, let's take a look very briefly at a couple of questions. Uh, the person I recommend it was Christy Laris, 2008 study. After I'm done, I'm gonna to try to shoot you a link if there is time. Somebody's asking me about self metalinguistics. We'll talk about that in one second. Um, somebody's asking about focusing on vocabulary goals. I don't know if I have time to answer that, but let's save that for last because I want to make sure I finish everything until 1230. Okay, let's see. Okay, so common comprehensive tests, including the Castle, the Owls, the Rask of itself, they really poorly identify language and literacy deficits of students secondary to having weak or unidentified discriminant accuracy. So 
these tests cannot distinguish between language and literacy impaired students and typically developing students. There was a big discussion of felt piece for evidence-based practice on CASEL 2. Uh, basically, there appeared to be some spectrum bias when it came to the determination of the reference standard and the sensitivity and specificity. OWLs and RESCA do not have sensitivity and specificity measures mentioned in their manuals. RESCA e-developers specifically said their test cannot be used for diagnostic purposes. For the cell 5, I discussed the fact that the reference standard is um, was deemed to be unacceptable by the reviewers from the leaders project. Currently, this is the only test on the market which has strong psychometric properties. Please know me saying that is not an endorsement of this test. This test actually has numerous limitations. I can literally go subtest by subtest by subtest and specify every single limitation of this test. I'm mentioning this test simply because the psychometric properties are solid and it's much better if any other comprehensive tests at determining whether somebody has a disorder or not. But please note, this does not mean that I think this is the best thing since sliced bread and everybody should be using it. This test has a number of limitations, just like everything else. I'm simply going based on numbers and facts. Okay. Let's look at the sensitivity and specificity levels. If you remember the plant and uh, Vance, I'm sorry, Vance and plant slide from 1994, you will see that the sensitivity and specificity is acceptable for every single age of this sex beginning from six to 18 years old. Uh, there is a slide on cut scores I excluded because I was including way too much for this particular presentation and I knew I would run out of time. That was never in question. But this is important to understand. There are certain core uh, subtests which are sensitive to the determination of disability on the tills. For the range of six through eight, if you give them vocabulary awareness, phonemic awareness, and non-word repetition, if they score below the cut score of 24, they have an impairment. For 8th uh, through 12th group, it's different subtests which determine a disorder. They're, they're, it's a lot more heavy literacy stuff. So we have non-word spelling, reading, and uh, written expression. The cut score has shifted. The cut score is a numerical boundary which determines if somebody has a disorder or not. If you get 34 or above, you do not. If you get 34 or below, you do for that particular group only. As you can see, the cut score for the 12 to 18 group is much higher and is now at 42 and has also different type of subtests, which were unrelated to the previous groups. So the cells, the way they look, they designed the test, they looked at the core composites. These were the composites which we determined most sensitive to the determination of the disability with a particular cut scores being at a certain range. And when you get those, this is what, if you get below that, you have impairment. So how do we uncover hidden language deficits? Very simple. We need to do a few more clinical assessments than necessary. We need to look at discourse competence, narrative competence, and social communication and pragmatics. So to assess semantic flexibility skills, I do recommend using certain subtests, but not entire tests, and only if you have them available. I do not recommend that you go out and purchase these tests simply because it's not necessary. You can assess semantic flexibility skills for narrative and uh, discourse tasks. So this is simply one way you can do so. The portions of Expressive language tests too do have a way of having kids define certain metalinguistic and metacognitive words. Tell me what a la what language is. Tell me what a word is. Tell me what a sentence is. Those are very important words for kids to understand if you're going to be literate. Similarly, the flexible word use subtest from Word 3 Elementary, it looks at the kid's ability to provide two completely different meanings for verbally presented words, but you cannot use the same words in your definition. 
So if somebody tells you, tell me two different meanings of the word fly, you have to tell them, well, one could mean uh, an insect, but another one is when something is soaring in the air. You can't be using the word flying or flying again, because it tells me that you are unable to semantically manipulate your vocabulary, you have certain semantic rigidity, and you don't truly really understood the directions for this assignment, nor are you able to execute it because your lexicon is not robust enough to do that. For this, somebody asked about the clinical evaluation of language fundamentals, metalinguistics for ages nine plus. I do legitimately use two subtests from this test for my comprehensive assessment. I look at multiple meaning subtests, which actually does a very decent job for evaluating the student's ability to recognize and interpret different meanings of selected, selected um, uh, lexical at word level and structural sentence level ambiguities. So for example, the fish was ready to eat. What two different things could that mean? Okay, well, the fish was cooked and it was ready to be consumed or the fish that is swimming in the water is hungry and it's looking for its next meal. Another subtest, which is also quite decent, is figurative language. And it's quite useful if we want kids to see if they understand certain expressions. Here is the limitations of the test. It starts at nine years of age. Well, our, you know, middle linguistic and the cognitive abilities start developing from, from infancy, essentially. So nine years of age is simply not going to cut it. It's way too old. And then, of course, in the real world, the presence of visual and written stimuli is also not terribly helpful. You don't walk around with a little book of, you know, multiple choice answers to assist you. So it's not terribly representative of a real world. The sensitivity is its best at the cut score of one standard deviation. So basically, at standard deviation, sensitivity is really high. I wouldn't worry about specificity, even though it's a tiny bit below 80%. I'm more worried about this test dropping the ball and not identifying impaired kids rather than identifying uh, kids with, who are typically developing. Please note that the score of 85 on this test is one standard deviation below the mean, which basically means scale score of 7 and percentile rank of 16 on this particular subtest, both the multiple meanings and figurative language, are below average. They're not in the average range. They're one standard deviation below the mean, and as such, they should be treated as below average range. Okay. So how can we assess uh, discourse and narrative abilities? Well, we can assess discourse and narrative abilities best through clinical measures. So some of the things I do recommend is uh, using, I liked what is posture, I like the procedure set forth by the SALT software people. I think that I love using those books. They have some free scripts and rubrics. So I've definitely adapted what they do for my own purposes. Uh, so here's what they recommend. They recommend wordless picture books for the three to six range. They recommend certain picture books for the elementary range. I, for upper elementary range, middle school and high school, recommend the pure conflict resolution task. Since we have about 12 minutes left, and I don't have as many slides left. I kind of managed to catch up. I'm going to quickly show you how to access this one. This is like a really quick way to click on that. So hopefully it's going to open up without any issues right away. And there you go. So when you click on that link, which I don't know why it's taking so extraordinary long, maybe because it was because it's Microsoft Edge. This is an example from my blog post, and it talks about how to analyze discourse abilities of adolescents. Uh, everything is heavily referenced, so you can seek it out. That particular article is completely free. You can access it for free as well. So when you click on that link in the handouts, it's going to take you to this page, and it's also going to take you to some examples and how I analyze those examples. And this is, you know, some references for that. Okay. 
guys, what I'm going to do right now, I do see that the chat is exploding and so is the Q&A. I would like to finish this before I address the questions, just because I wanted to make sure that I give you all of this information. So I will be looking at the chat in the Q&A, but as soon as I'm done with this. So this is an example of what I mentioned before from the SALT folks that with the SALT elicitation books. So we're talking about Frog, where are you? is really quite useful for preschool to first grade. Pokins gets her way, second grade. Porcupine named Fluffy, third grade. And Dr. DeSoto, they recommend fourth through sixth grade. I don't, I recommend really fourth through fifth grade. I start using peer conflict resolution essentially pretty early. Um, even typically developing 10-year-olds know how to resolve conflicts. Certainly 11-year-olds do know as well. So I start using the pretty early because it gives me much better information regarding their complex syntax abilities. If you wanted to access a free script, all you need to do is do the following, and I can actually show you this right now. So you type in something like this. Frog, where are you script? And there you go. This is from Salt People. Somehow I can't never find it on their website, but it's perfectly right there. You want to find the rubric? You go, you do this. Frog, where are you? Rubric. And there you go. And by the way, these are the rest of the rubrics. So this is Frog, where are you? Gives you this beautiful rubric of how you can look at that. All right. Oops. There we go. Depending on how I exit, it kind of takes me back. Similarly, the same thing for these books. Bookends gets her way. Uh, there is no script because this is now a book. So you gotta buy the book yourself, but rubric will be available there. Porcupine and Fluffy, rubric is there. Okay. So my sample narratives. Well, they give you so much information about kids. They give you information about their organizational abilities, their coherence and cohesion, their perspective of taking abilities, their microstructural abilities, their microstructural abilities, their working memory, their processing speed, their syntax and grammar, their vocabulary and semantics, and their pragmatics. So you need to sample narratives because one two minute narrative sample they're gonna give you back is going to be so incredibly more representative of their real world ability to use their language than any test you can ever give them of standardized nature. But there is a caveat. You need to know how to appropriately interpret that. You need to be able to appropriately interpret those results because if you do not know what you're doing, you're gonna think something is completely fine when it's not. All right. So why is sample expository discourse? Uh, expository discourse is, of course, uh, the pure conflict resolution. Well, it's really complex genre of language. It's a really complex form of language. It uh, really elicits very complex syntax. And it's really highly salient for adolescents because what's salient for them during this time period is they want to make peer interactions, they want to resolve interpersonal conflicts, they want to gain peer acceptance. So this is a perfect uh, a task to start eliciting on uh, that complex syntax from them when they start reasoning and discussing it. It's really advantageous because they really need to use very complicated thought, complicated logic, and complicated reasoning skills. And that's going to prompt them to use even more complex syntactic structures to explain their thoughts. So because of that, this is absolutely fantastic. Again, you really need to know how to analyze that. You cannot just assume when they tell you something, you really need to know your adolescent language structures. Pretty hardcore because you may be confused regarding what you're seeing. You may be thinking something is completely acceptable when in reality, it absolutely is not. So that's very important to understand. Assessment of pragmatics. Um, this is currently the psychometrically uh, strongest test on the market of pragmatics that I know. Again, I'm not endorsing this text of test for any other reason, but because of what's in the manual. 
I do talk about its limitations on my website as well, because I did do on my, on my website, you can find clinical assessment of pragmatics, and I can tell you which subtests I find not as useful for certain kids versus which subtests I find incredibly useful. So again, this test is not without limitations. No tests are without limitations, but it really has very solid psychometric properties and a strong reference standard as well, really high reference standard. So I really need to replace this image because I can do a much cleaner screenshot. This one looks so poorly executed, but look at these chord composites. Please look at the sensitivity and specificity. And this is for classification of autism spectrum disorder. I assure you, this test is just as competent for the identification of kids with developmental language disorder with difficulties in the areas of pragmatics. It just has the same specificity. Originally, when the test developer, Dr. Lavi, did this, she was primarily interested in the ASD population. But I have used this test with countless number of kids with developmental language disorder. And I assure you, it is just as sensitive. So I am personally really happy with using it. And nowadays, I used to really like the social language development test. And nowadays, I really only use it with six-year-olds because the CAPS only starts at seven years of age. This is how much I rely on this test because it really gives me qualitatively very solid quality info. So, conclusion. Because students with reading impairments continue to be underserved in the schools, it is really important to supplement literacy testing with psychometrically sound standardized language assessments. So this should have said standardized language assessments. I apologize, I missed the word language. Clinical assessments, such as narratives and discourse, are needed because you want to uncover irrelevant deficit areas and you want to adequately reflect the learner's difficulties in the real world. Students need to undergo assessments which will result in targeted and relevant therapeutic services. Assessments have to give you diagnostic information, and that's needed to formulate targeted treatment goals. And anything else is a denial of free appropriate public education, of which all students are entitled to, and it's absolutely never too late to help. Lately, I've been working with essentially 17.9-year-olds, 17.10-year-olds, and I have a couple of college students which may be coming in. I've, I've assessed them. I provided intervention services or somebody else provided intervention services. They're absolutely thriving. So it's never too late to help even when somebody is college age or young adult. You can actually do tremendous amount of intervention even at that age group. Anybody wants to see me for a presentation, um, you can basically click here and go ahead and access my list of presentations. If you like what you heard, if you want to, uh, you know, get me for your school or somewhere else, you can take a look there. This is my list of presentation topics by categories. This is my reading related presentation topics, um, if you are interested. This is some information I mentioned, uh, I'm a co-owner of a CU Smart Hub, so just wanted to show you what we have going on. Somebody uh, mentioned that we were interested in more information on uh, language and uh, on the use of animated films for evidence-based purposes. We do have an upcoming conference that is coming up in 11 days. And when you look at the schedule, I'm going to be presenting twice. So we have a fantastic lineup. First of all, we're going to have Dr. Teresa Ukrainitz talking about contextualized expository intervention to promote competent, confident learners. I'm going to put that into the chat in, in case anybody wants to see that. I'm going to present the narrative skill interventions. We're going to have Dr. Archibald talking about evidence-based strategies for supporting working memory. We have evidence-based interventions for grammar and morphous syntax, supporting literacy learning across grades for, from Dr. Wallach. This is the course I've been talking about, use of animated films to target language goals. And if you're interested about evidence-based pragmatic video interventions, Dr. Lavi, the developer of the CAPS test, is going to be doing that. We also offer a science of reading certificate for SLPs. Information of that could be found here, where we talk about the total package and a total integration of all things. 
Um, I know you guys cannot see the websites because of the way I shared my slides. So I am just sending you guys links to everything. So I am just, um, the way my slides were shared, I'm gonna try to reshare, but somehow the way it's arranged, let me try doing that again. The way everything was arranged, um, I'm not sure if there is a way to share everything. So there is only a way to share a particular thing. So, uh, so that's why I'm sending you links. Uh, can everybody see the screen? So these links are gonna tell you, I'm not gonna click on any of these. They're just gonna take you to some of the things uh, that I mentioned before, some of the presentations. And uh, this is um, my contact information for my website, my blog, and the group SLPs for Evidence-Based Practice. So I am now gonna stop sharing my screen and I'm now gonna look into chat and I'm gonna look into questions. So let me see what I can do. Let's see. Okay, there was a tremendous amount of chatter that they couldn't see a website screen. I'm sorry, the way this, um, the way the screen can be shared, nobody can share everything. They deliberately need to stop sharing and reshare individual slides. Whatever you missed, you can just tell me what you missed and um, I'll just uh, reshare that. Oh, sorry, the links for the rubrics. Yes, I'm going to send everything right now. I'm going to share my screen and show it to you right now. Sorry about that, but let me try to share it like this. So right now, I apologize. Everybody sees this Google screen, right? Just hit yes. Yes, perfect. This is how you find the rubrics. Uh, let's see. Ba, 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 ba. Okay. Talk about your rubric. There you go. You hit that. And that's the rubric. Okay, you go back. Type in frog, where are you script? And there you go. Frog, where are you script? Okay, what else did you guys want to see that I tried to show you? And because it didn't um, share very well, um, I missed, I might have missed it. What else did you want to see? I'm going to start answering some questions. So if anybody wanted to see something else, let me see. I answered the questions regarding uh, the specificity and sensitivity of the self. Frank asked, if disorders are based on normative samples, how to decide who to, who to include in a sample or not? So technically speaking, you're not supposed to include anybody in the normative sample. Normative sample should include just typically developing kids. Normative samples should not include any disordered kids because you're normalizing the disorder. However, you can use a group of kids in particular categories who you think your test can benefit from, uh, such as kids with autism, kids with DLD, and so on and so forth. You can include them in a pre-standardization sample for certain tasks which will reliably determine that kids with who are impaired will not pass, but typically developing kids will pass the flying colors. So the answer is for the normative, normative sample data, no test developer should be including any kids with disorders because you don't wanna normalize a disorder. You certainly don't want to, when you're trying to, I'm, I'm gonna use the same example twice, when you're trying to determine if somebody has diabetes, you don't want to include glucose markers for people with diabetes. You want to make sure that the only people who are included there are who absolutely unequivocally do not have diabetes. So you don't want to include somebody with glucose markers, which are like whose glucose levels are 350 or 240. You want to make sure that everybody has a glucose under 100 or under 150 nowadays. So that's what you wanted to do. So you don't want to normalize something because otherwise you're diluting your sample. Okay. So let's 
So let's see. Discriminant accuracy. Discriminant accuracy is your sensitivity and specificity measures. It is what determines who is impaired and who is typically developing when they take the test. It is how this specific test, it's also on the slides. So when I wrote about sensitivity and specificity measures, the, the collective term for that is discriminant accuracy. Okay. So let's, uh, so what we're going to do, we need to dismiss a couple of things that I answered already. I'm happy to dismiss them myself because otherwise I keep thinking that I haven't answered them. Uh, if cell five is the main assessment used to assess language in the UK and Ireland, are you aware of a better language assessment based on normative sample from Ireland and UK? I am sorry, I am not. I would email Brooks Publishers to determine if we can use that. I am. I would. Uh, I would call them or I would email them and find out. Can a student have a reading disorder and not have a language disorder? To be honest, every single kid who everybody claimed does not have a reading disorder. They had an underlying language disorder, but their underlying language disorder deficits were very, very subtle. But in my practice, in doing these comprehensive assessments, and I've been doing them for years and years and years for complicated cases, I'm going to be honest with you. I've yet to see a child who didn't have underlying language deficits if their reading was, in, if, uh, their reading was impaired. All of these kids definitely have, you know, all of these kids definitely have those issues. It's just you have to use the correct tasks in order to, um, you know, in order to do that. Okay, so. Let's see. Um, guys from Florida, Ida, would you mind if I handle the questions myself? It makes it very difficult um, for me to kind of do this because some things uh, some things are being answered live, some things are being typed. So if you can allow me to do that, I think it might be much easier for me to handle the questions. So if everybody just lets me do that, because I see, for example, Mandy, you know, would like to answer this question live, but I already, that question doesn't need answering. So if we can just let go of everything, I think I might be able to be a little bit more efficient with that. So. A let us ask, what do you use with six-year-olds? I use with six-year-olds the social language development test, elementary normative update. That's what I use. Okay. If a student scores low on listening comprehension measures, what is the best ways methods to intervene? I don't intervene for listening comprehension because listening comprehension cannot be separated from receptive and expressive measures are artificial divides. We're really looking at the totality of oral language competence. So what you are addressing, if somebody scores low in listening comprehension, look at the totality of their testing, figure out why they're scoring low. You're not gonna be, you're not gonna be doing intervention for listening comprehension. The moment somebody opens their mouth, they are speaking. Therefore, you're not intervening for listening comprehension anymore. You're intervening for oral language competence. So what you're going to be looking at is you're going to look at the totality of your scores and you're going to be looking at the reason for that. So that would be the reason why. Okay. If we already know that the child has a language-based learning disability, which are the best interventions or where can we find the best plan for SLP in the school? So... This is a very broad question. So it's kind of like, again, I'm just gonna keep using this example with diabetes because I like it. So if I already know that I have diabetes, what is the best treatment plan for it? Well, there is actually not one medication for diabetes. There is numerous levels of, there's numerous types of medications and then there's different types of diabetes. Some are better managed than others. Some, can, some will need pills, others will need shots. Some will need this type of medications, other ones will need that type of medications. Are you getting what I'm trying to say? 
There is no one uniform intervention because everybody is going to be showing deficits in, dif in different ways. So what you're looking at, assess appropriately, catalog all the deficits, and then explicitly address the deficits. That's what you're looking at. I am working on developing a particular application which would allow SLPs to figure out the best treatment options based on whatever the difficulties the child is displaying, but they need to answer, answer a host of information about the child first, and they better have the answers, otherwise they won't be able to use the app, and then they need to be able to answer the assessment results. So it's never about generalities, it's about how can we carefully create a tar targeted treatment plan for the child based on their assessment results? Okay, so Kristen says, I work with a reading specialist who does not see or understand how language and literacy go together despite conversations and information. Is there a resource you would recommend or do you have something that I could explicitly say that would help her understand? Um, I can use... Let me see if I can give you this, it might help. Okay. Maybe try this one, Kristen. I'm gonna put it into chat. Actually, I can, no, I don't have to put it into chat. I can give you an answer here and I can also put it into chat for everybody else. Uh, guys, if you really want me to address your questions faster, put your switch your questions from chat into questions, Q&A. Okay. So is the Castle 2 still useful but needs to be supplemented with a narrative assessment or is it not worth using? If you're asking for my subjective opinion, I can, I can absolutely tell you I have not purchased it, I do not use it, I do not have use for it. That is my subjective opinion and this is what I'm saying. It had occurred as a result of me reviewing the test, reviewing the subtest, reviewing everything about it, and finding that that is not the test I wish to use. Because I've also seen a lot of these, a lot of Castle 2 used with students who basically came to me for comprehensive language and literacy reassessments because they were still struggling very, very significantly in the school system and they're not getting appropriate levels of support and I was able to show that my results were dramatically discrepantly different from the results of Castle 2 and in reality the children were functioning far worse and in a far more impaired fashion than the Castle 2 results showed. Hope that helps. Okay. Please explain how non-order petition is such a good indication of reading problems. That's not exactly what I said. If you look at the slide and look at the references, which I used for non-word repetition under the assessment tasks, you will actually see the reasoning and information there. So you need to look, you need to find the appropriate corresponding slides, you need to see what is actually written there, and then you need to read the accompanying articles, which are available for free, and there you will see what we are referring to. It is not a good indicator of reading problems. It is sensitive to reading difficulties, but not exclusively so. And non, so it's a little bit more than that. You can actually do incredibly well on a non-order petition tasks and be an incredibly poor reader. Okay. Um, on the normative sample question, something like dyslexia is often based on moving cutoff numbers. Nope, that should not be the way how it would be determined. Then if somebody is arbitrarily moving cut scores, we already have a problem. Cut scores should not be moved arbitrarily. Uh, RTI progress, RTI progress is flowed with difficulties and that's another problem um, or such measures. So given this, it seems hard to decide who does or does not have a disorder in any given sample is what I was getting at. Hopefully this was clear. Uh, to be honest, this process you're describing is a lot harder to determine because this is not how I would approach of who has and who does not have a disorder. You also need to be aware of all the controversies surrounding the label. Presently, we cannot differentiate between 
dyslexic readers and poor readers supposedly who not, do not have dyslexia, but that is the presentation for a different day on a different topic, but I certainly do do that. So the problem with your question is, it's sort of like it's a trick question. It cannot be answered appropriately because it's sort of asking not necessarily the wrong thing, but it's alluding to all the things which are unnecessary to the determination of a disorder because the process to which was used to derive to the determination of a disorder was inherently flawed. I hope that that was clear. If not, we can continue this conversation at a later time. What tasks would you use to better assess language and literacy to determine a language disorder with a concomitant reading disorder? Okay, I would definitely use narrative analysis. If I want to use, if there's a single task I could use for a reading disorder, I would use maybe a couple of semantic flexibility tasks and I would definitely use a narrative or discourse analysis. That's definitely going to help me to determine if somebody has language difficulties. As long as, of course, I know exactly how to interpret my results. Because using getting a narrative sample and staring at the narrative sample after it's transcribed without knowing what to do with it is also not terribly helpful. So a huge component to this is interpretation of what am I seeing. Okay. Will we have a follow-up on how to remediate DLD? It's a very broad topic. It's like asking how do we save the earth, essentially. That's not how that works. Uh, we could certainly have ineffective evidence-based treatment methods, but they're not done for a label. Nobody ever does anything for a label. It's like looking for a needle in a haystack. You're never going to find it. You want to talk about how to, okay, we can talk about how to specifically remediate pragmatics. We can talk about how to specifically remediate morphology. We can talk about how to specifically remediate syntax, but we cannot talk about something so incredibly broad. We don't know what to do with it. Again, it's a trick question because it assumes certain things which cannot be assumed. Is there a way to download my slides? Um, yes, I, a link to my slides was given in the chat multiple times. I believe uh, I posted that already. Give me a second. I'm going to find it and give it to you. If you literally give me one moment. It is now... Let me give it to you. Okay. How do you separate auditory memory difficulties from narrative difficulties in a story retelling tasks? Why do I have to separate them? They're still an indication of a problem I need to remediate. I'm not gonna separate them at all. I'm gonna relish in them. I'm gonna use that and consider what can I do to improve a child's abilities during narrative intervention. I don't wanna separate anything. I look at the problem in a totality. So when I look at the total problem, I want to remediate the total problem in a specific way. So I don't want to separate anything. It doesn't matter if somebody's having auditory memory difficulties. If they're having auditory memory difficulties, they'll probably have a whole host of difficulties which affects their language. So might as well treat their language. But if I'm going to start separating things and dividing them into artificial categories, that's not going to help me much. I do not believe CEUs available for this presentation, but certificates of attendance are, and I do believe participants will be getting an email which will explain to them the procedure and how to do that. So how do we remediate pragmatics? Hopefully that works. Beautiful. I love that question. Thank you very much. Um, we remediate pragmatics currently. There is a tremendous amount of evidence for video interventions. I did provide a reference to the Power Up Conference. Dr. Lavi is going to be talking about evidence-based um, informational methods for remediation of pragmatics. I do that in my psychiatric hospital all the time with huge amount of success. I highly recommend that. So if you want the link to that, I'll resend it again, but it has been posted in the chat. So uh, some of the most effective remediations are through video work and video modeling, but actually the correct term for it is video analysis. So you want to look at video analysis and you're not just looking at pragmatic abilities and uh, pragmatic remediation because pragmatics are very tough to um, remediate. You're also looking into expressive language, verbal reasoning, problem solving, and so on and so forth. Um, 
Shirley says, I use salt software and rubrics to analyze the narrative samples. Do you use anything else? I use the rubrics. I don't use the salt software because I find limitations in how they approach grammar and syntax. I do it myself based on normative on the norms. I only use the rubrics, but not the software. I basically rely on knowledge of developmental norms to remit it to um, analyze narrative samples. And I do have a presentation on that topic. It's called Clinical Assessment of, of Narrative Samples. And it's actually as one of the links in my handouts of my presentation. Um, somebody asked for some information. Give me just one second. Somebody said that they're a newly graduate student and they're not so certain regarding how to um, uh, analyze pragmatics. I can put that information here. And I can um, put it in the chat as well. If anybody is interested, this is just a product, but if anybody is interested in the course, that's available through the CEU Smart Hub. Give me just one second to um, put that in the chat. But this is the name of the presentation. Give me just one second. Here. I will just, I just put it in the chat option. Before that, I didn't. Okay. Do you use sugar? Is it applicable? I do not use sugar. I don't like sugar. And I mean that both literally and figuratively. Uh, I don't use sugar because the most important things, sugar lives out. Sugar lives out all the word finding issues, all of the difficulties with linguistic reformulations. They don't count any of that because they, you, they make you look at the kind of like a naked sample. And that's the problem. When you look at certain samples of kids, once you cleaned it up, you got rid of supposedly a disorder, but many disordered kids have tons of word finding difficulties. And that is why I never subscribe to sugar or like sugar. Comprehensive tests and phonological processes. What are my thoughts on this? It's a good test. I use it all the time. It doesn't have sensitivity and specificity measures, but it is decent enough. It is accurate enough. I have been using it for years. Definitely recommend. Not without limitations, of course, but then what is? Is the conference limited to SLPs? Absolutely not. The conference is uh, for all related professionals. It is not limited to SLPs. Somebody asked me about the TNL2 test. Do I recommend it? I do not. I do not find it to be accurate in determination of narrative difficulties. If you want to know the problems with, um, with that test, then If you want to have any, um, if you want to know the problems of the test, access SLPs for evidence based practice group and uh, type in TNL2, and you will be able to find information on some of the limitations of the test. I'm just going to very quickly look at chat to see if there is anything else. And it appears to be that I absolutely answered all the questions for everybody, right? Yes, I think you absolutely did, Tatiana. And thank you, thank you so much. That was awesome. I love how fast you talk. <laughs> I just hope everybody's thinking fast, as fast as oh, you talk. And it's it my awesome. limitation, and I'm so sorry for that, Judith. But oh, no, no, oh, okay. that's a good thing. <laughs> I started knowing I'm going to overwhelm them with information, but I know that they can go and take the slides and do it themselves and read everything themselves. I started knowing I produced way too much. It's way longer than one hour, but I was like confident, you know what? What's the worst that could happen? They're gonna hate it? All right. <laughs> No, I want to thank you so much for your expertise, your knowledge. It was a brilliant, comprehensive, resource-filled um, session and um, so much information. But again, because you're willing to give us the slides and the recording, I think many of us will go back and you know listen to it again and, and really look carefully at those slides. So thank you so much. And I also want to take this time to thank all our participants. We had a wonderful group of 
uh, many, many folks from near and afar. So thank you so much for getting up at 3 a.m. I know somebody said this was at 3 a.m. from where they were coming from. So that was Naya James, I remember that name. Because when somebody yes. tells you, I am up for your presentation at 3 a.m., boy, do you appreciate it. <laughs> That's right. So um, if anybody does think of other questions um, or comments, I'm sure Tatiana is willing to answer them at her website or with her email. And if not, you can send them to us and we will forward them to her. So thank you again to everybody. And please be on the lookout for messages on Facebook, Instagram, our website regarding our upcoming webinar webinars. And I also want everyone to mark their calendars and save the date for October 7th and 8th. Uh, we are hopefully planning, no, we are planning, but hopefully that this will be an in-person conference. Um, and I think because so many people are hitting that webinar fatigue in you know, some instances, we are really looking forward to an in-person conference and you know, we would love to invite all of you. It will be in Orlando at a really great hotel. So please mark your calendars. Thank you again to everybody. Have a wonderful weekend and we look forward, forward to seeing you again. Thank you and so happy Valentine's Day, too. Oh, yeah. Happy Valentine's Day. I had a blast, you guys. This was amazing. Uh, Thank you so much for having me. I'm happy to do this again. If there's any topic you find on my list of reading-related presentations, I'm all up for that. Love giving back something to the community. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you so much. I see someone writing thank you. Is that in Russian on the chat? No. Do you see that? No, I think, what is, is this, is this Swedish, is this Norwegian? Wait, I'm not sure. I'm huh. not familiar with that language. It's not German, that's for sure. No. Interesting. Well, thank you in every language to everybody who has um, joined us. Mandy, did you want to add anything? Mm -hmm. Frank, anything? And thank you so My much. For, and thank you so much for helping me moderate you guys. I'm sorry, I just, I moved so quickly. That's mm -hmm. one of the reasons why I just wanted to answer more questions. So, Mandy, absolutely no worries. It's just I move at lightning speeds. No, oh, that's great. That. <laughs> it's great. all good. It was brilliant. Thank you so thank you. much. That's, thank you so much. Yes, thank you, thank you Tatiana. Thank you. thank you. Goodbye. Keep Bye -bye. in touch, everybody. Hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.